Hello, everybody. It's good to see you virtually for Min uh, web chat with Minnesota Adult Education. Today is the first day of November, and I know many of you see snow on the ground today, uh, And but I'm glad that we are actually able to get together virtually, if not in person. Let's go to the next slide. In today's session, um, after welcoming and introductions, we're going to talk about accountability, then grants and finance. Next, about the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act plans. Then, about high school equivalency updates. Then, transitions, professional development, and we'll try to make sure we have plenty of time for your questions as well. So, it's a packed agenda again today. Let's start off with some introductions of our state adult education team at the Minnesota Department of Education. Hi, welcome, my name is Brad Haskamp, my pronoun pronouns are he, him, and I'm the State Director of Adult Education. I'm gonna hand it off to Astrid. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Astrid Leiden, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Professional Development Specialist. Brandy is uh, not able to be with us today, so I'll turn it over to Haley. Hi, I'm Haley Swanson. I, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the records, grants, and admin support here at the team. Hi, everybody. I'm Jody Versa. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the program quality specialist on the team. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Julie Dinko. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the transition specialist at the Department of Education. Hello, my name is Neil Allard. I'm the records, my, my pronouns are they, them, and um, I'm the records communications and administrative support specialist here. Excellent. I I really appreciate the team and I'm so excited to actually have a full team for the first time in more than three years. I can, I mean, like many of you, we have been facing staff shortages and that's really impacted our capacity as a team. Um, uh, in addition, it's been the most challenging year for us as a team, at least for me personally, um, since I've been at the Minnesota Department of Education. 2023 has been a really tough year, a really challenging year. And I've heard that from many of you as well. We've had many staff, uh, we've had staff with illnesses and, and leave and other issues, uh, hiring process or limited staff like many of you have faced that's limited our capacity. Um, I was so bummed that I was not able to join all of you at Summer Institute, but I'm so grateful for Astrid, Brandy, and Julie for representing Minnesota Department of Education at the um, at the um, Summer Institute, our first Summer Institute in four years, and it sounds like it was an amazing event. I'm also thankful to Astrid and Brandy for going around to both of our North and South regionals and representing our team. So thank you so much, Astrid and Brandy, for being the 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 for representing Minnesota Adult Education um, and our state team at the Minnesota Department of Education. Let's go to the next slide. So let's start with some accountability items here. Um, so first, we want to put a shout out. Uh, just make sure that all of your classes, all of your programming is correct in the hotline. So please make sure that um your uh that you maybe go to the to the uh go to the hotline and check to make sure that your sites and your classes are accurate. Um, look for your class titles, the tags for your classes, the hours that are listed for your classes, and the types of classes, whether they're in-person, hybrid, or at a distance. Um, also, um, make sure that your locations, your site addresses and information is correct, and all of your contact information, emails, websites, telephone numbers, please make sure all of those are accurate as well. This Minnesota Adult Literacy Hotline is one of the um, is one of the big way uh, one of the most public ways that are uh, that your classes get seen by other people. I know in our office we're referring people to the hotline every single day. So please make sure that you have um, the, that information correct in the hotline and note that the hotline is actually populated by what you have listed in SID, our state adult education database. So 
If you have any issues with what you see in the hotline in terms of your classes or sites, please make those changes in SID. And if you have any questions or uh, on how to make those changes, please reach out to the SID support staff. And thanks, Haley, for putting that information in the chat. You can see there on screen, that's what the um, hotline looks like. I apologize, Neil, there was a link in that in that, uh, in that that image. So if you click on the image, you'll get to the web, to the hotline. Thanks, Neil. All right. So, it, as a um, by October first, we're all, uh, our state system is required to submit all of our our annual reports to the feds in terms of our data and performance. Uh, and it's helpful to know that. Uh, so, I want to share some of those outcomes with you today. First off, in our report that we noted this year in twenty two twenty three. We had more than 29,000, nearly 30,000 participants in adult education. That was up um, almost 5,000 participants from last year. And we're getting really close to the 1920 numbers. So that is great to see. That is excellent. Um, you really are working hard and serving more people. And I'm and I'm so grateful for all of your hard work and your efforts. It's We're seeing that in the data. Also, it's great to know that out of the five measurable um, WIOA indicators or the federal indicators of performance, we met our targets on four out of the five. Um, so that is excellent. We met our, our targets in measurable skill gains, in exited students employed after six, mo six months after exit, in employed uh, students one year after exit, and in the median quarterly earnings. So congratulations. It's great to see our students succeeding and meeting or exceeding federal expectations after they're leaving our program. So congratulations. If we keep up this work, um, we look to be able to meet our 23-24 targets, which you can also see on the screen there. And the other important note here about our 23 um, reported outcomes, they all exceeded the 2022 report. So we did better than last year in terms of our outcomes in every single area. The one area where we didn't meet targets is that uh, credential attainment rate. And if you've heard me talk about that, that's a really complicated uh, rate that's measuring multiple things. And there's really no one sentence that can describe what credential attainment means. So um, I, uh, it basically looks at those who uh, earned a diploma and see how what percentage of those that earned a that were eligible for diploma programming earned a diploma and then went on to post-secondary or employment within six months. Also, uh, it's looking at those who were co-enrolled in post-secondary and how many of them earned a post-secondary degree within one year. So those are complicated measures and it's really, uh, we've not done well with that since that's been implemented as a state, but still we did better than last year. Let's go to the next slide. Also, we want to make sure that we also give a chance to share with you, like, not only how did we do as a statewide system, but I'm sure you want to know how did our consortium do in terms of employment and wage outcomes. So Haley will put in the chat a document that shares um, your each consortium and their employment six months after exiting for their participants and the median quarterly wages for those that were employed six months after exiting adult education. So that I uh, want to make sure that you have all have access to that information um, as, um, as a consortium. And so if you open that up, let's go to the next slide. This is what the what the top of the document looks like. It just clarifies and you can see each of the consortium in alphabetical order. You can see the total students, that's participants, what number of uh, participants had a social security number in SID, what is your percentage of students with social security numbers in SID or participants? And then how many were matched for employment? Again, we can only match for employment if there's a social security number in the system. And then what percent of total participants were matched for employment utilizing the federal metrics that we need to use? 
And then for those that were employed, what was that median quarterly wage? So you can see that for everyone and you can compare yourself to neighboring consortia or to uh, pro, uh, maybe consortia that are very similar to yours. Let's go to the next slide and we can break this down a little bit more. I apologize, Neil, I embedded yet again uh, a link in the, in the image. I'll try not to do that next time. So looking at those uh, numbers for participants that exited adult education and then were employed six months after exit, first off, it's helpful to know that in terms of the percentage or number of students with Social Security numbers, that percentage by consortium varied greatly. One consortium was as low as 19.57% of their participants had a Social Security number in SID. That is far lower than our 60% expectation. Um, so there you see quite a bit of, of variance there. One consortium had 100% of their uh, participants that had um, Social Security numbers entered into SID. So might want to take a look and see what your, what, how did your consortium do? And then in terms of that per range of what Per, uh, percent of participants were matched with as employed was anywhere from 13% to 60%. Again, a big range there. And you can see that there's definitely a correlation in many cases for the percentage of the, like the percentage of students with social security numbers entered into SID and, and students matched as employed. So you can see a good correlation there. I have a question in the chat. Can ITINs be used when the student is an asylum seeker that hasn't received their social security number then? Um, and Brian's asking a very similar question about TIN. Those numbers cannot be utilized because those are not connected with employment. Um, in fact, many in many cases, people with ITINs cannot be employed. And so they are not tracked for employment <laughs> by deed in our system. So note, we cannot use ITINs yet at that point, um, at this point in time, because that's not how DEED utilizes tracking employment. There's no employment measure that we can that we can look at with the ITIN. Just a note: if you're not muted, please mute yourself. So let's go on to the next slide. And then in terms of wages, um, the, you can see that the quarterly wages range greatly as well. So for those students that were employed in our system after exiting adult education, that those wages at six months were anywhere from $930 over a 90-day period or a quarter to $12,158. Uh, so a wide range there um, within our consortium. I think there's some really interesting questions that we can ask ourselves there with those out with those outcomes. Again, this only looks at for those that did have employment, what were the wages? So it's not looking at those that had zero wages, but it's it's those that we did track that they were employed and had some wage in the system according to the Department of Employment and Economic Development. Helpful to compare that with the poverty line in Minnesota. For a household of one, a single person, the poverty line for a quarter is $3,645. So we can see that even after exiting our system, there are, in some cases, there are many of our students that are still below the poverty line. Let's go to the next slide. So moving on from performance to assessments and accountability, we're happy to announce the newly approved assessments that you can use in Minnesota include CASA's Steps Reading, CASA's Steps Listening, those are both English language learning tests, and CASA's Goals Math. They have been added to our Minnesota Adult Education Assessment Policy, and they are also available now in SID and can be used for our national reporting system purposes for official pre and post tests, for, that can be used for measurable skill gains. I encourage you to take a look at the updated assessment policy. It can be found on our um, Minnesota Adult MNABE policy page. Thanks to Haley for putting that link to that policy page in the chat. 
quick note about that assessment policy, we found a typo in there. So we um, about uh, uh, which about test approval and which format. So we updated that and just I put a new version of that in the on the website yesterday. So I encourage you to download that newest version from yesterday and utilize that. Let's go to the next slide. So looking at some of these tests by which type of student or level that you're, you're trying to assess. So with our ABE levels, again, not ESL levels, but our ABE levels, one through six, our tests that you can use are CASA's goals reading, reading CASA's goals math currently, and now math CASA's goals two. And, um, and just note that um, the new math goals two test can be used through uh, July 13th of 2030. Note if you're using the CASA's math goals or goals one um, or that original math goals uh, test by CASA's, the approval for that test ends June 30th of 2024. So you will need to transition if you're doing math assessments to math goals two by July one. Let's go to the next slide. And in terms of our ESL levels, again, not the ABE levels, but the ESL levels, uh, we have uh, two new tests that are uh, with CASA's listening steps and CASA's reading steps that are approved through 2030 now. Note that all of our other approved uh, CASA's ESL tests, uh, including beginning literacy and life and work, the approval for those tests for official NRS or national reporting system purposes uh, ends as of June 30th. So you will, if you're doing English language learning instruction and using tests for ES to gauge at ESL levels for official pre and post testing purposes, you will need to switch to the listening steps and or the reading steps by, Ju by July 1. Let's go to the next slide. And a helpful reminder is that pre and post tests must be in the same series. So you can only get a level gain or a measurable skill gain when a person pre and post tests in the same series. So let me talk, break that down to make sure I'm clear in that. So the example we have here is that you have an English language learning student uh, who uh, pre-tested in CASA's life and work. And so they have that pre-test score in CASA's life and work. Now, in order to get a, an, a measurable skill gain, that student must uh, must take a post test in life and work and or they need to take a brand new pretest in steps and then another uh, post test after 40 plus hours of instruction where they would get um, a, gain, a gain from that steps test. You cannot pretest in life and work and post test in steps and expect a measurable skill gain from that action. You need to always pre and post test in the same series when you are, when you're, if you want to get a measurable skill gain. Now, granted, you could have someone that still has a life and work test, and you already start giving them a new steps pretest, and they can be kind of working in both uh, modalities or both series at the same time. But just note that the steps test does not affect the life and work pretest score. The steps test would be a brand new additional pretest. Go on to the next slide. And then in terms of how to enter this information into SID or get access to these new tests uh, in SID, uh, you can add them to your drop downs on SID, but each staff person must log in and customize your own test me uh, menu. Now, uh, Haley's going to put in the chat here that SID help article link so you can see how to do that if you're unsure of how to do that. Thank you, Haley. And so take a look at that if you have any questions about how to uh, make that change in SID. And of course, the SID support team, if you still have questions, that SID support team can help you with any additional questions you might have. Oh, Chrissy, great question. Will there be training for the new step series? You're, that's a wonderful segue. Let's go to the next slide. There is ways, there are multiple ways for you to learn more about the new tests. So first, uh, in the Minnesota ABE Connect newsletter, there is an article for the steps and the goals to test to kind of give you an overview of those. And all of these links are in the chat as well. There also is information on the CASA's website where you can see more and also purchase the new tests. 
In addition, we have our support services conference for adult education on Thursday, November 16th and Friday, November 17th. We'll have lots of test information there. On Thursday, there'll be the CASAs and TABE implementation certification training. That Remember that uh, CASAs and or TABE implementation certification training is required for all staff that are utilizing or implementing those, those uh, any of those tests. Um, you need to get certified once uh, initially and then recertified every five years. Now, you don't need to get recertified just for the new tests. However, I'm sure many of these helpful, this helpful information about the new tests will be in the other trainings will be very helpful for you, but you do not need to get recertified because of the new CASAS tests that have been approved. Um, and then on Friday, there'll be information at our general session right away in the morning and through the concurrent sessions about the new assessments. And then finally, if you want to learn more about the new CASAS assessments, the, er, the next opportunity is actually today at 2.30 p.m. So uh, so that it's let's talk about the new CASAS assessments. If you're interested in that session, that webinar is today at 2.30, right after our, our web chat. And you can sign up and the link is in the chat is has been shared by uh, Haley from our team. So thanks, Haley, for sharing the link to that, uh, to that webinar. I encourage you to uh, join that session if you're able. Oh, Elizabeth asked, uh, uh, Betsy asked a question about, should we plan on phasing out our use of the Table 1112 math series? Note that there's been no change in Table 1112 math approval yet. Um, so uh, I cannot remember what the expiration date on those tests are. I have, um, but I I know there's there's no tape replacement yet for those Table 1112 math tests. Astrid, can you help me out? Are there any other questions in the chat that I should make sure I uh, address? No, I think you covered them all. Excellent. Yep. But we do have our test trainers on today. So if there are other questions people want to pop in the chat, go ahead and put those in and we can respond in the chat. And Linda already helped us out. So right now the Tab 1112 reading math and language tests, they are set to expire. Thanks for finding that expiration date. So yeah, Betsy, I, I hear what you're saying now, or that helps me remember. Uh, so those are currently only approved through June 30th of 2024. My understanding is, and Linda, please chime in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself. I believe that TABE is going to try to get those 11 and 12 tests recertified or their, their approval extended. Is that true, Linda? I had heard from the last webinar, this was Linda Keller, by the way, um, I'd heard from the last TABE webinar that the DRC was planning to resubmit 1314 for approval to the NRS in October. Um, and that's the last that I've heard from them about any testing oh. updates. Okay, so there is no uh, plan to try to get the reading math or language TABE 1112 tests uh, their approval extended beyond June 30th by by DRC, the publisher of the tape tests. I had not heard that information, no. Okay. So as you can see, we don't know all the information uh, because that's between the test vendor and the federal government through their test approval process. As Linda noted, the uh, test vendors have to approve, have to submit their test for approval by um by in October. Um, and then they get assessed and approved, evaluated over the course of the next several months. So we do not know if there will be TABE reading, math, and language tests approved after June 30th. We still do not know the answer to that yet. So if you feel anxious or need to make and want to start planning now, you can look and see which tests are approved for that. Um, and that would be the CASA series that's currently approved. But again, we, there, there's several months between now and July 1st, so we don't know what will officially be approved as of July 1, beyond what we already have listed. See another question in the chat. Will there be um, will there be another CASAS assessment webinar coming up um, soon, especially if someone can't attend today's session? Um, Linda, uh, Linda and or Marty, I encourage you to kind of unmute. I'm assuming you're leading those sessions today about the new CASAS assessments. Um, will those sessions be re will that session be recorded?
Well, I'm hearing from Patsy in the chat that the that um, if you register for today's webinar, even if you cannot attend, uh, Atlas or someone will send out the recording afterwards, so you can listen to the recording afterwards. In addition, there will be assessment sessions at the uh, at the Support Services Conference in November, which is a virtual conference. And I'm sure there might be other opportunities, either through our state test uh, assessment trainers and potentially even through CASA. So, so stay tuned and look for additional opportunities in the future, too. But I'd encourage you to check out what um, the, the recordings, even if you're not able to attend today's webinar. Let's go to the next slide. So we'd love to hear from you in the chat now. Obviously, as many of you are going to need to make some changes with which tests you offer for official pre and post testing purposes. How is your program planning or thinking about making the change or the transition to the new CASAS tests? And have you already administered any of the new tests? If you have, do you have any reflections to share? Please share in the chat or you can click to raise your hand and we can call on maybe one person. I hear while you're thinking about sharing in the chat, Liz, uh, Elizabeth is asking, is someone advocating to continue TABE 11 and 12, changing to a new test like the TABE 13, 14, it would be an expensive process rate for, for, for providers. So we cannot advocate for individual test series. That is a process that's approved by the federal government based on which what the test vendors are willing to submit and advocate for themselves. Um, so that's a that is between the test vendors and the federal government. Um, we can, it, any advocacy that we do really doesn't have any impact because every every test in order to be approved needs to go through that process. And um, and so for table 11 and 12, it would have to go through that process again and address all of the concerns that the feds have. And in many cases, that's so expensive that uh, on the test vendor end that they're just it's easier for them to just implement a new test or recommend a new test than trying sometimes to readapt the tests. Um, so uh, so it's most likely that they have to develop new versions of those tests uh, just to provide a little bit of clarity about that federal process. Astrid, can you help me with the chat in terms of anything else? Absolutely. So a lot of folks talking about um, their plans to that either people have ordered new tests or are planning to meet with staff to talk about transitioning to the, the new test. We do have a question about accommodations. Um, Steph says we are using accommodations time and one half for testing sessions for our learners. Will steps be able to work with that now or do we need to add that for the new steps? Great question. I'm gonna ask uh, Marty, as our, Marty or Linda as our state test trainers to chime in and help address that question. Marty or Linda, are either of you able to share? So Linda said in the chat that yes, steps will also be able to provide accommodations for both reading and listening. And just a reminder that um, the, the administration procedures really will change very little. These are um, multiple choice tests, just like uh, life and work. So it should be a fairly smooth transition in terms of test administration. Yep. Absolutely. And then I hear, uh, so a couple other questions I see Susan asks, will students be able to make a level gain um, if their pre-test is a cost of life and work and their post-test is a cost of steps test? No. Um, uh, maybe let's go back a couple slides where we had that example on screen. If you pre-test in cost of life and work, you need to post test in CASA's life and work if you want to try to get a gain. If you move your students right now to CASA's steps test, then that would be a brand new pretest, and then you would have to post test them in CASA's steps in order to get a measurable skill gain. You have to pre and post test in the same series in order for those gains to count because uh, those series are treated almost as completely different tests. Thanks, Brad. Um, another question about pricing, and I'll again defer to maybe Marty and Linda who have, have done some ordering about the um, difference between um, ordering in bulk, like looking at ordering for a whole consortium versus an, uh, an individual site. 
Um, Linda, thank you for responding about the different um, ordering packages and if you can chime in about the cost. Elizabeth is wondering about does workforce or deed honor cost us steps? So any program that is part of the WIOA programs uh, needs does need to adhere to our assessment policy. And Julie, correct me if I say anything wrong on our uh, Julie and our team, Julie Dinko. But uh, we do we have had inquiries from our other WIOA programs, especially WIOA, WIOA Title I Youth and um, adult programs, they were curious when we're adopting the new test because they have to um, implement the tests that we have on our approved assessment policy. Yes, that's correct. But also if you are using some workforce development uh, locations, um, just need an educational functioning level to um, determine if someone qualifies to participate in a particular program. Um, and oftentimes they will turn to the RABE partners if that person has already been enrolled or maybe possibly having the ABE partners come and assess a group of learners. Um, and as long as it provides educational functioning level, it should um, it should be admitted or it should be fine, but it's up to them to choose um for the basic service test if they want to go with adult basic education or if they want to uh, um, administer their own like some of them still use the rat um, to provide that testing i appreciate that thank you julie and then we also have a question about any financial support from the state to purchase the new tests i just want to remind everyone that we have um purchased uh bulk purchasing of um, e-testing at the state level for a number of years now, and that's been available to all consortia. If you haven't taken advantage of that, I uh, encourage you to contact Marty Olson. Marty, if you can put your email in the chat. Um, that's been one way that we've been trying to financially support um, the use of tests. We don't currently have any funding allocated for the purchase of paper-based tests, um, but that might be something we could consider if there are um, under if there's underspending in our supplemental service grants later in the year. One other thing to note about the purchasing the test for the last two years now, we've actually been paying for your um, we've been paying uh, for each consortium's uh, SID license, distance learning license, and all those other fees that would normally come out of your accountability and test assessment aid. Um, and so that money is now freed up. And so St. Paul, we've reallocated money for, uh, Saint Paul, to St. Paul to do that for on behalf of the, everyone in the state. So you should actually have an additional percentage of our amount of funding and, and accountability aid with your federal funding that you can utilize to uh, pay for tests. So that should have freed up some money at your at your consortium level as well. Brad, I think we've gotten through all of the questions at this point. Excellent. Thanks, everyone, for all of your questions and for your ideas as you're moving to the new assessments. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Haley. Haley. Perfect. Thank you, Brad. And thank you for all the information shared so far. So we're going to take a little bit of a shift. And we're going to have a moment we, where we get to celebrate a little bit of our accomplishments in adult ed this year. So if you notice on these tables for the contact hour and active enrollee comparisons um, between 2022 and 2023, we've seen about an 18% growth in both hours and active enrollees between the two years. So that's very interesting. We've got data available from May through September so far with plans to send out this information to fiscal managers, program coordinators, and lead teachers quarterly going forward. So it's exciting to see from last year to this year as we do comparisons of both our contact hours and our active enrollees by month, we're seeing uh, an 18% growth. So that's really showing how your work is, like how we're seeing that, that evidence of your additional service month by month and uh, in all of our in our data so thank you for your work and um so scott's asking so that will mean a drop in contact our funding and this trend continues quite possibly depending we don't know what that state amount of adult education funding will be um so we can't make that 
we can't make that speculation yet. But in general, if the uh, total state pot of funding is equal, is the same as from one year to the next, and if there's growth in contact hours from one year to the next, then generally, yes, contact hour rates would drop. It's a little early because there are a lot of other factors at play yet, though. Yeah, and as Jody notes, that that will mean a drop in contact hour rate, possibly, but not the total amount. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next slide and just note in the chat that um, that uh, that we have for you. Neil put in the chat. You can see a five year comparison. Where have we been? 2019, 2020, 2021, 22, and 23. You can see our data year by year, what it looks like month by month. And that's for contact hours and active enrollees per month. So please take a look at that if you wanna do some analysis of year by year, um, how how we're doing as a state um, and how that those trends look over the last five years. And then surprise, happy new year to, uh, to all of us. Uh, we just found out uh, that we are going to be monitored by the feds. It's our first uh, monitoring visit since 2014. And the feds told us that we're one of the last states to be monitored since WIOA was implemented. Um, so what this looks like from Jan Monday, January 29th to Friday, February 2nd, we, um, the entire state adult education team will really have to block off that week and we'll be working with the feds that week um, as they monitor us um, and we have, we'll develop a day-by-day -day schedule of what is included in that monitoring. Part of that, um, probably Wednesday of that week, will include site visits to your local consortium sites or to a handful of consortium sites. We do not know which sites or which programs will be visited yet. Um, that will be in a negotiation that we have with the feds later on. For those of you that were part of the 2014 monitoring visit, you'll know that the feds were, uh, they had a very detailed agenda or specific agenda of what they were interested in and what they were not interested in. For all of you that do get uh, selected to be visited, we will do a little prep webinar uh, conversation with you. So stay tuned. And as we have more information about what this monitoring visit will include, we will share with you as we are able. Um, but that was uh, a very happy New Year surprise for us on the team. So uh <laughs> so that will keep us busy and keep us on our toes. Helpful to know that, you know, when, when the feds came last time in 2014 uh, and did their monitoring visit, there were a variety of changes that we had to make to the system through their citations. Um, and so they will, uh, so that will, and quite likely that will be the same this time. Um, so that could result in changes in our data system, in our policies, um, some things that happened last time with a monitoring visit that forced us to move into SID from our two, uh, from our two data system uh, uh, approach, and it required us to reinforce that 40 hours before post, uh, before post testing uh, policy and rule. And there were a couple of variety of other things um, that took that we had to implement over the next couple of years um, after that monitoring visit. So just uh, just know that this will be uh, this will be uh, there. This will likely require some changes to our state system or, or modifications to make sure that we're in compliance with federal expectations. Uh, I did see a question: How will sites or programs be selected for visiting? That will be up to the feds. Uh, they will be looking for a variety. They want to see a wide variety of programs, um, and in that includes uh, amount of federal funding that's received. So they'll probably want to see big programs, small programs, middle-sized programs. They'll want to definitely see some IELCE grantee programs, um, and they might want to. See, and I'm not sure what other metrics that they're going to use. So not entirely sure yet. Stay tuned. Thanks for the positive energy. I really appreciate that. And our team will really appreciate that as we're prepping. Also, just note that this visit requires us to do um, quite a, a lot of extensive data collection and documentation before they come. So we'll have to spend lots and lots of hours pulling all this together. Basically, it's a lot like us pulling together a new narrative um, between now and the end of, of January. Okay. Yes, definitely exciting. Let's go on to the next slide. 
Excellent. I'm going to turn it over to Jody. Jody. All right. Thanks, Brad. Uh, so we want to give you um, some information and some reminders about grants and uh, finance things. As I get started with those, I just want to start um, with making sure we're all on the same page with some basic terms that I will be using um, when we're talking about grants and finance. We usually talk about fiscal years. I'm going to talk about um, FY23, which is the year that ended this past June. And obviously, the year we're in now is FY24. So just making sure that we all know that that FY stands for the fiscal year. Um, the other, another thing, another acronym that we use a lot when we talk about finance is UFARS. So UFARS is a, essentially, it's a set of accounting codes and it is required uh, for any entity that receives a grant from MDE, uh, it's required to use UFARS. Um, so that is all of you who are listening, even though um, I know that some of you out there do not work for school districts, uh, but even so, you do have to use these UFARS codes. Those of you who do work for school district, your district accounting office will be very, uh, you know, familiar with UFARS and will be using it for many things in addition to our adult education funding. So just some examples of UFARS codes. One area of the code are finance codes. So those finance codes or FIN codes just tell us where did these funds come from? Uh, so the three codes that we talk about a lot in adult education is FIN 322, that's our state adult ed funding, FIN 438, that's our federal adult ed funding, and FIN 801, which are IELCE grants. So just wanna start by uh, defining those terms. Then I want to remind everybody of um, this pretty unique carryover um, option that we have for FIN 322 funds for state ABE dollars. So just a reminder that in state statute, uh, we have um, an allowance that up to 20% of the total amount of state funding that your consortium received for the fiscal year can actually be spent in the first quarter of the following year. We sometimes call that quarter five. Um, this is a pretty unique thing actually in terms of education funding. So the accounting people in your business office may not be very familiar with this, which is why we tell you about it um, often uh, on these web chats. Um, so this year, um, if you, got to the end, if you got to June 30th and had not used up all of your FY23 funds, then it would have been possible to use them for expenses that happened between July 1st and September 30th. We always encourage you to think of this as one-time special funding for something, um, you know, sort of um, that a special project or something or some equipment like Chromebooks, or a new um, curriculum, not ongoing funding. Like you don't wanna use this funding in this way to uh, fund a new position. But it is a really good way if you, uh, we know that you have to do some estimating and some guessing about exactly how much funding you're gonna get year over year and exactly, you know, staffing and programming and things. So this is a really good way if your guess was a little off and you have funds left over at the end of the year, please do use them up in that quarter five. Just be very careful that your business office knows that when you do this, it has to be course coded correctly with UFARS codes. So course codes are another kind of UFARS codes. They just are, are kind of distinguish different ways that funds can be used. For the most part, generally throughout the year, all expenses should be course coded 000. But if you have any of these quarter five expenses that you are carrying over, you have to use, or the business office has to use the correct course code. For this year, that course code is 003. And the code does change every year. So on the next slide is a preview. Um, if you did it this year, if you carried over FY23 funds this year, those need to be course coded 003. 
a year from now, you need to be using code 004 and it um, matches that pattern going forward. So please just be really sure that, that um, those expenses are coded correctly when using that carryover option. So um, this is also the time of year when we will be sending out final fiscal completion reports. So this report will go to our fiscal agent contact for each of our uh, consortia across the state. And this is the uh, this is a report due back to our office where basically uh, you you are detailing out and um, certifying to us, how you spent your FIN 322 and FIN 438 state and federal funding for FY23, including it's important on this report that you accurately document if you carried over um, and, you, and used up that money in the first quarter of this year using course code 003, it needs to be documented accurately on this report. This report will be emailed out this week by the end of the week. It's this year it will come from Haley's uh, email address. So be watching for that. And it is due back to our office uh, to Haley via email by December 15th of this year. And then on the next couple of slides, just a couple of other things uh, to highlight because they relate to um, this report and the reconciliation process that we do once we have received all of these reports. Uh, we want to remind you uh, that there is there are caps on how much of your adult education or ABE dollars can be spent on administration. There is uh, there are. For the most part, these are a 5% cap. That 5% cap applies to state ABE funds, federal ABE funds, and also to any funds that you get through an IELCE grant. So FIN 322, FIN 438, and FIN 801. And just a keynote, because this can be confusing, we know uh, some of you work in consortia that has one fiscal agent entity, and then a number of downstream providers who get some funds passed on from the fiscal agent. It's important to know that that 5% cap is a cap on the entire award amount. So you cannot have the fiscal agent take their 5% and then other downstream providers take additional funding for admin costs. That is not the intention um, of those caps. So we just wanna be clear about how those caps work. On the next slide, um, there is when you are thinking about that admin cap, um, it's important to think about a couple of UFARS codes. So in UFARS, object codes are used to identify what kind of expenses was this? Like what was this money spent for? So an error we often run across when we do the reconciliation process is, um, money that is coded or expenses that are coded to object code 110 as opposed to object code 120. So 110, object code 110 should be for the salary of an administrator, but not the person who directly oversees ABE. So probably if you're listening in on this webinar today, your salary should not be coded 110 probably because probably you are overseeing teachers and day-to-day -day operations of program or maybe you are teaching um, or maybe you are running day-to-day -day operations of the program so object code 110 really usually is could be the community ed director if that's your boss it could be the executive director if um, that's the person that you report to so it is an upper level administrator uh, who is not involved in running day to day programming. So this is a mistake we sometimes see. Sometimes we see if the salary of the ABE manager gets coded to object code 110, it may quickly um, exceed that 5% cap and that will raise a red flag on our end, but there is no cap on, on that object code 120. Um, so you can go ahead and uh, report the full amount of the salary of the ABE manager because that's not an administrative expense. That is a day-to-day -day 
programming expense. So Clarice, I do see your question about defining administrative expenses. Um, I'm a little hesitant to give you an official formal definition because um, I don't have it right in front of me, but generally speaking, what we are talking about are not the day-to-day -day costs of programming, um, but the sort of overhead um, administrative pieces um, that are kind of taken off the top of every stream of funding that comes in. So the caps for those expenses are 5%. Generally, I would say the one you need to be paying the most attention to and one that we will that will cause a flag in the reconciliation process is this uh, the distinction between code 110 and 120. So if you want to make sure you're not exceeding the cap, that would be the first place to check with your business office is making sure that what's coded to 110 doesn't exceed 5% of your total award. So on the next slide is a resource about UFARS. Um, UFARS is a pretty um, extensive, complicated thing, and I've just mentioned a little bit of it today. We did just want to point out that there is um, a lot more information and support available to you about UFARS on the MDE website. If you are interested in that, if you want to um, talk some of it through with your business office people. There is a manual that is put out. It's updated every year. Um, and a couple of key chapters in that is chapter five describes the object dimensions. So that describes what different kinds of expenses those object codes um, are used for. And then chapter 10 will tell you if you have a finance code, like finance code 322, that's your state ABE funding, what are the allowable object codes? In other words, what, what can you spend that money on? So that chapter 10 and those permitted code combinations is also a useful chapter. So then I'm going to pass it off to Julie to just give some reminders about IELCE. So for those of you who have integrated English literacy and civics education grants, a couple of reminders. The first quarter of the grant cycle has passed and the financial reporting form was due October 16th. There are still a few grantees out there who have not submitted this form. Please send it to Negatari Valens and the email is included here. And the second thing I want to mention is that site visits to grantees will be scheduled December through June. Um, additional information about the site visits will be sent out in November. And I am going to turn it over to Brad. Thank you, Julie. Let's talk about our WIOA state, uh, state, local, and regional plans. WIOA stands for the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Let's move on to the next slide. So first, it's helpful to know and important to know that there is a state WIOA plan. What is it? It is a plan that details how our WIOA programs will operate and utilize federal funding and match state funding. And this includes the Minnesota Adult Education System. We are Title II of WIOA. This plan has common sections that apply to everybody in WIOA. And there's also program specific sections that per directly pertain just to Minnesota Adult Education, for example. Now, if you want to see where, if you want to take a look at the current WIOA plan for Minnesota, there are two places that you can check out. One is the federal WIOA plan portal, and you can see the link there that, that Haley shared. And then indeed, the Depart Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development has their own WIOA site. And the link is also there in that site. You can see both the state plans and the local and regional plans, as well as some other Minnesota specific resources. So take a look at either site. Um, and if you look at the federal site, you can actually pull up other people's WIOA or other states WIOA plans as well. Also, it's important to know that states are required to complete a new plan once every four years, and then they have to revise it every two years. Our next four year plan is due in 2024, 
and that will be for 2024 to 2028. Let's go to the next slide and I can tell you a little bit more about the timeline. So our, in terms of our timeline, uh, December 8th is when Deed would like all, uh, is the due date for the first drafts of each of the state plan sections. Just a quick note, a, a funny slash ironic note, is we still don't have the guidance from the feds of what those specific, uh, program specific sections need to include. So we are, we'll have a very short time to pull this section together or this plan together. And then by the end of December, uh, the state plan will be submitted to the Governor's Workforce Development Board Executive Committee, as well as the Governor's Workforce Development Board State Plan Special Committee. And then Jan and as of January 15th, the state plan will be submitted to the Governor's Office for review and then posted for a 30-day public comment period, which is required. From January 15th to February 15th is when that public comment period will be open. We encourage you to submit to review the plan and submit any feedback during that time. And then March 6, there will be the Governor's Workforce Development Board meeting to approve the state plan based on the public feedback. And then we are required and then we are hoping to have this submitted by March 15th of 2024 um, to U.S. Department of Labor. That is our goal at this point. The feds might try to push this up a couple days earlier, but this is already moving extremely quickly, especially when the feds have not released their official guidance yet. They say it will come out sometime in November, which gives us less than uh, a month to actually develop the plan. Let's go to the next slide. However, it doesn't mean that we haven't already been talking about what that plan will include. So there are three major goals um, that have been developed through the work Governor's Workforce Development Board that have included all of us uh, state uh, WIOA program leaders. And we've been participating and, and uh, uh, contributing to these goals. First is the first goal is to increase interagency and local area coordination and alignment. This means sh uh, creating more shared goals, trying to find more efficiencies and coordination across both our funding, our processes, and our programs. Um, and then create that no wrong door approach for folks coming to any of our sites or any of our WIOA programs. That's goal one. Let's go on to goal two. Goal two is to really work with employers and industry to create partnerships across the state to that uh, that that create and develop workforce development programs and extensive career pathways that includes work based learning on the job training and other types of of workforce development. And then if we go on to goal three. And goal three is looking at creating a more inclusive equitable, accessible, and proactive workforce system that serves all Minnesotans and pre uh, preparing employers and the current and emerging workforce for the changing nature of work. And that includes using new and emerging technology, uh, being reflective of changing labor market demands and looking at our state's shifting demographics. So those are the three goals that are proposed for our new state plan. The Governor's Workforce Development Board has approved goals one and two, and they're making some, they're proposing some slight modifications to goal three as we go forward here. Now, I'd love to hear from you initially. This is a big question, so I understand if you don't have any immediate feedback, but just think, think a little bit more generally. In terms of our Minnesota adult education system, what would you like to see highlighted? Um, or changed about our system that maybe would be, come out or that we talk about in our state WIOA plan? Are there any program innovations that you think we should try to highlight? Any successful strategies that we should try to share in our plan? Any types of changes that we should try to avoid or any challenges that you want us to share in the plan? So please just take a moment to think about, are there any issues, strategies, changes that you'd like to see highlighted about our state adult education system. Please put that in the chat. I'm curious if there's anything that jumps out to you. Again, this is a big question. 
So I understand. Karen Walters, uh, you're saying that we should really highlight our adult career pathways and our IET work. Excellent. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. Anything else? Highlighting some of the regional work that some of you are doing. Yeah, I, I like that south, the Southwest work and the Northwest work. Yeah, there's definitely some great innovations there that we can contribute or can highlight. Highlight our work preparing learners for college, like the College Readiness Academy. Several areas, Southwest, Southeast, and Northwest. Thanks for that correction. Those statewide online training courses and the regional online courses. Excellent. Please continue chiming in in the chat and I'll keep reading through those, but I'm going to turn it over to Julie and the next slide to talk not just about the state plan now, but we also have local and regional plans to consider. Julie. Thanks, Brad, and thank you everyone for the uh, great suggestions on what to highlight in the WIOA plan. Um, well, Brad just described what is the state plan. There are also uh, local and regional WIOA plans as well. And to give you um, an update here, DEED, which is the Department of Employment and Economic Development, will provide guidance before November 8th on what the local and regional and state plans will look like. Um, they will provide a template that will go to local and regional areas, uh, a template for uh, how these plans should be written. What I've heard is that unlike last time, they're trying to provide a little more flexibility and a little less fill in the blank around some of the um, requirements for the local plan. Uh, your local workforce development board ABE representative is the contact for ABE programs in the workforce development area. Um, and Haley put a link to where you can find out who that individual is. And I think they uh, do an incredible job of making sure they're re representing not only their own consortium, but the entire area that they serve on that local board. Um, you will be hearing more about the local and regional plans, and hopefully, um, I hope that the ABE representatives on the board will all be included in contributing to what those plans will be reporting on. We're especially looking for people to emphasize referrals to our other WIOA partners, which are like the youth program, dislocated worker program, and the adult program. These plans are not due until May 6, but remember um, this is like a group effort and it takes time to um, go through this process. So more to come on that. And with that, we will move on to the high school equivalency or HSE. And I believe Brad is taking these slides for Brandy. Yep, Brandy is out sick today, so we wanted to make sure she had a chance to get better. So while she is out, I'll take over those HSE slides. Let's go on to the next one. So one thing to note for folks in terms of records requests and age waivers, we'd had a couple of questions uh, lately about this, but we have the um, the information at the uh, on the Minnesota Department of Education page. If you go to our Minnesota Adult ABE or our GED page, you can get a records request or an age waiver form by scrolling to the bottom of the page and see and you can see those forms at the bottom. Unfortunately, we can't put those higher up. This is how the this is the required MDE template that we are supposed to use. So just uh, so we, we acknowledge it can sometimes be a little frustrating, but just scroll down to the bottom of the page and you can find those uh, those two forms. Let's go to the next slide. And then in terms of GED manager, we've had quite a few folks asking for GED manager access lately, whether it's to be to reactivate an account that has been, been deactivated or due to a lack of use or requesting new uh, access. So if you need to request GED manager access, uh, Haley put the link in the form. There's a there's a page on the G, on the GED testing service website where you can request GED manager access. And then that gets approved by both GED testing service as well as our state team. So please go to that GED manager access page um, to request GED manager access. 
And let's go to the next slide. And in terms of high set, there's a webinar coming up on uh, November 29th at 2 p.m. To explore, called Exploring the High Set. So this is a session about uh, for educators, support staff, and program personnel who are interested in learning about High Set, what it includes, and how to navigate the High Set website. It's a one-hour webinar, and uh, there's quite a few topics that will be covered then, including an in introduction, test structure, how to register, how to schedule tests, study preparation and resources, as well as a High Set website walkthrough. So please register for that event if you're interested. Haley put the link to register in the chat. Let's go to the next slide. And then in terms of accommodations, we just want to make sure that you understood how to apply for accommodations or where to get more information about accommodations, whether you're looking at GED or HiSET. With GED, they have their email that's on the screen there. Um, and the new update for GED accommodations, approved accommodations, they say are now valid for two years, according to Brandy. She, she heard that from GED Testing Service. And then uh, there's a telephone number for HiSET to request more information about accommodations. And with HiSET accommodations, uh, Brandy said that high, uh, uh, PSI, the test vendor for HiSET, that they said approved uh, accommodations are valid indefinitely. However, you have to get a new approved accommodations request for each different subject test. So that's our understanding about the new updates or information about the accommodations for each of those testing systems. If you have any questions about that, um, please go to the to accommodations at ged.com and ask them or uh, call the HiSET uh, information number for more information about HiSET accommodations. I see, uh, Astrid, can you help me with questions in the chat? Absolutely. Um... We have, first question, has any consortium besides St. Paul implemented this? I'm assuming by when we say implemented this, maybe you're saying uh, set up a high set testing center. If you're saying that, um, then yes, uh, I know that uh, Scott Helen and, and the uh, Harmony site, they've also set up a, a high set testing center and there's a couple other test centers in progress. I'm not entirely sure of our exact number at this point in time. Um, but there are a couple of high, uh, in-person high set test centers uh, uh, in Minnesota, and there are multiple others that are in development. Also note that like GED, high set, you can also take that test uh, via online proctored. So that is another option for high set if there isn't an in-person testing site, just like that, that option with GED uh, currently. Yeah, and Scott's confirming that Harmony is, I believe, up and running. And then if there's anyone else who has a, to, uh, high set in person testing up and running. If you want to put that in the chat, um, similar question from Chelsea. I'm curious how many consortia are offering high set instead of GED, and um, I'm interpreting that as a programmatic question. Um, and I think what we um, have been trying to encourage folks to think about is high school equivalency preparation in general, so that students. Um, can come to your program and prepare for either test, um, whatever fits their needs better. Absolutely. Well said, Astrid. Okay. And um, Elizabeth, any insights about high set versus GED? Um, encourage you to attend the webinar coming up at the end of, of November. Um, and um, as Lindsay um, just put in the chat, instructionally high set and GED have are overlap in many in many ways. I think that one primary difference is just the number of tests um, for tests for GED versus high set, which has five, um, because reading and writing are separated into two different tests. Excellent. I think we've caught all the questions here. Okay. Yep. Thanks, Astrid. I encourage and you to, to bring your questions to um, either the high set webinar at the end of November, and then there will also be a high set session at the support services conference. There is one question in the chat about cost difference for students. Note that uh, anyone can take their first GED or high set test for free using the uh, subsidy code uh, MNHSE free. Did I get that right, Haley? Yep. Okay. 
And I'm going to put that in the chat as well, just so you know. So uh, in theory, did I spell that correctly? Yes, I did. Um, that can be used for GED or high set. Uh, and that means your student, your student, if they have a Minnesota address, can take the test for free, one full battery. And so you can utilize that. So in theory, both tests can be free for individuals. Uh, in practice, there um, there is you'll have to look at the different tests for their different for their different full battery prices. Uh, and retakes are treated differently across both tests. So HiSET has um, has a more complicated uh, pricing structure, which differs depending on how you're taking the test. Whereas HiSET or GED. It's for the first test, it's 136 for an entire battery, no matter how it how you take it, um, the test. So uh, so we'll explore that more as we go through the high set professional development. And uh, we can and Brandy can continue to share additional information about those tests. Uh, earlier on, we did share a document that was a, a side by side comparison of GED and high set. And there's been some talk maybe that maybe someday we could update that again if we can get some updated information from the test vendors, but stay tuned. Sure, one questions? final question about GED manager. Kirsten's asking, can two people have jurisdictional view only access within a consortium? So no one at the consortium level can have jurisdictional level access. That is only for state level staff. Jurisdiction equates to the state of Minnesota. So no local program staff are supposed to have jurisdictional access. Two people at the same site can have student authorized view access. And two people, if they are test proctors, they could have test center administrator access. Um, or if you're working in a jail, two people at that same site could have corrections access for that jail site. Um, but no, but people, no one at the local level should have jurisdictional access. No worries, Kirsten. The terminology gets confused and I get tripped over it myself all the time. All right, with that, I think we are good. I'm gonna, let's go to the next slide and then I can turn it over to Julie. Julie. Thanks, Brad. Uh, transitions. I tend to chunk transitions information into transitions to employment, transitions to post-secondary, and transitions to training. So with transitions to employment, there are a few updates that I want to give people. The Empower to Educate program, which offers these great resources for anyone who's interested in getting into, to begin a career in childhood or uh, child care. Um, can access these. Someone asks, do you need a high school diploma in order to participate? You do not need a high school diploma or you do not need to take, have an HSE or anything like that in order to participate in this training. Um, there's a link here. Um, they translate things into many languages. It's a great opportunity for, um, for individuals and learners to take advantage of. Uh, next slide is the... Um, Next Generation Certified Nursing Assistant, free exams. Last year, you may remember that we did, were able to leverage some free exams for eight adult basic education learners uh, who were preparing to take the nursing assistant exam. This year, there is a new requirement that they need to complete an online three-hour refresher training, excuse me, before receiving the promo test next slide or promo code to test. Next slide, please. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I reached out to the RTCs and asked them if they can help identify ABE programs that have nursing assistant training programs. And the ones uh, that I heard back from, I have listed them on this slide. <laughs> if there are additional programs that offer it, please email me with that information so I can include you on any information that gets sent out um, from Health Force. Next slide, please. So this coming Monday, Health Force Minnesota, and they are the ones who are coordinating this grant um, that, that 
for additional funding to provide the free uh, testing, we'll be giving a uh, webinar on what does this refresher course look like? What additional resources are there available for students? and how they'll walk through the steps of how an individual learner can access the promo code after they've taken the refresher course, how you sign up for the refresher course, et cetera. The hope is that eventually programs will start to embed the information in this refresher course in the training that they provide. Next slide, please. Transitions to post-secondary. Uh, the big thing around transitions to post-secondary uh, is uh, the ability to benefit state plan pilot. Again, the reason we're doing this is to provide more pathways into college for adults with no high school diploma GED. And they tend to be disproportionately low income in people of co color. It supports the Equity 2030 and state legislators, legislators attainment goal, and it helps reduce barriers. So there's a link at the bottom of this slide, and I, I think it might also be in the chat, of where you can find the ABE programs uh, in the colleges, the Minnesota State colleges that are currently participating in ability to benefit and the pathways that have been approved for uh, learners to participate in. Now, many of you, this is still new information. We can go to the next slide. And so uh, the Minnesota State Office has recognized that, that it's new information, and we're continually trying to onboard new, to, new ABE programs in new colleges to take advantage of this. Um, so here's a brief description of what it is, but more importantly, on the next slide, there's information on a webinar that will happen at the end of November, and this is a direct link to, you don't have to register for this webinar, so the best thing to do might be just to copy and paste this and put it in your calendar now so you have the information, you can just join at, at two o'clock on November 29th. Um, if you're interested in learning more about ability to benefit, like what is it, how could I get involved in it, and what do I need to do to support learners? Uh, next slide, please. Transitions to training. So, Everyone should know that we have online, I should say everyone should know, if you don't know, there are online statewide training courses that are being offered. This is the second year of a pilot. Uh, and just remember that the referring consortium will count the contact hours of the learners that are participating in these courses. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see um, the courses that are currently being offered and the ones that will be offered. The Healthcare Core course goes through, um, or began September 15th and is ongoing. Microsoft Office spe Specialist courses has onboarding from one to four on the following dates. And then paraprofessional course will be, again, will be offered again January 15th. And then the Test of Essential Academic Skills Preparation course will begin January 22nd. Next slide, please. Just um, an FYI, expect delays with the Integrated Education and Training Approval Form. This is being revised and we did um, kind of get a, a few more changes that um, people wanted to implement on this form. So it is still being revised. Um, and just a reminder that what the big change is that the form will go to Atlas and Atlas will review the single set of learning objectives before it gets sent into the Minnesota Department of Education and in our unit here. Uh, next slide. And then just a, a update on funding. If, if people are interested in additional funding, there is a targeted population workforce program that or grant that DEED is inviting community-based workforce development partners to submit proposals for. There is an informational webinar on Tuesday, November 7th for those who are interested in this. Um, 
And when I looked at what services they're funding, a lot of them look like uh, adult basic education services. And a lot of them look like what many of our community-based providers offer, where they, they provide some sort of training with that as well. So that's just a funding opportunity available to those who may be interested in that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Astrid Leiden to cover the professional development. Great. Thanks, Julie. And I will, maybe you can take Paulina's question in the chat about um, the certified nursing assistant question that you had. Sure. But we'll just, we'll keep moving. We're, we're running a little short on time. Um, so let's go to the first slide. First, we just wanted to thank everybody who responded to our statewide professional development survey that was open in September at the beginning of October. This was a really important year for us to collect data because we're in the process of writing a new set of uh, request for proposals for our supplemental service grant program. So we'll be using those results to inform professional development um, that will be offered over the next few years. Um, so stay tuned. We are in the process of analyzing the data um, using our statewide advisory groups to help um, make recommendations for professional development based on the information that you shared with us. So we'll be reporting back to you about what we heard in that survey. So thank you again for taking the time. Next couple of slides, we talked about this in July, but just a reminder that we did roll out a new adult education staff training policy in effect as of July 1st. So any new um, staff who have not worked in adult education prior to July 1, do need to complete ABE Foundations training within the first 12 months of hire. And um, good news is that we were able to offer that in person again at Summer Institute in August. And we have a beautiful new refreshed ABE Foundations course, online course in Canvas that I'll talk about in just a minute. So if you have any staff who need that training, um, that's a great way for them to, to get that training. Go to the next slide. Just a reminder again that we a couple of exemption staff who have been working in adult ed prior to July 1 are exempt for from the ABE Foundation's uh, requirement, as well as those who have completed uh, the Hamlin graduate course that corresponds to that same content. And you can contact me with any questions about this policy. On the next slide, uh, just again, a reminder that you need to be um, documenting staff training participation for any of those required trainings in SID. And starting in August, when you turn in a variety of different reports, you will be using SID to report on required staff training participation when you turn in your August reporting submission. In order to help provide some guidance around um, making sense of the different professional development opportunities and to help you onboard new staff, um, Atlas has developed um, some great suggested training pathways for different roles in adult education. So I encourage you to check that out uh, for some guidance as you're onboarding new staff. Wanted to remind you about a couple of upcoming conferences and webinars. We have three excellent statewide conferences coming up in November, our support services conference for anyone who plays a support role in adult education. And those will include those official TABE and CASAS implementation and refresher trainings. The volunteer management conference for anyone who um, is using volunteers in your adult ed prog program or would like to learn about how to use them. That's on December 8th. And then the Language and Literacy Institute coming up in January, on January 25th and 26th. And Atlas will be bringing in two nationally known keynote speakers for that event. So you can register for those events um, on the Atlas events calendar. And as I mentioned, they will all be virtual. So access for everyone around the state. Some great webinars also coming up, as we mentioned today, in just a couple minutes, an opportunity to learn more and talk about the new CASAS assessments, um, a deep dive into MobyMax reporting and data. We have the first in our administrator series of webinars coming up on November 14th, Creative Ideas for Staffing, Recruitment, and Engagement. Um, as we heard from you all in the chat at the beginning of the webinar, um, a lot of programs facing challenging 
circumstances around staffing. So we have a few program managers from around the state who will kick off a conversation about some of the things that they've tried. End of November, hot topics and post-secondary partnerships. A lot happening right now um, around ability to benefit and the co-requisite model. This will be an opportunity to learn more. And then in early December, uh, our first math content webinar focused on um, working on math with English language learners. We also want to, let's go to the next slide, um, share information about some opportunities for some extended professional development cohorts coming up here in the winter. We have the Building an Ed Tech Strategy Toolkit course offered through L Literacy Minnesota. This is an opportunity for teachers to work on developing their own routines using educational technology. So this is a combination of some online work as well as webinars, more information, and the application can be found on the Literacy Minnesota Distance Education website. On the next slide, um, the Teaching Numeracy to Adults cohort is going to be offered January through March. This is for anyone and everyone who um, is interested in integrating math instruction into their classroom or program. Um, this also is a virtual opportunity, combination of online modules and webinars. Um, Lindsay piloted last year with um, some different teachers and managers and got great feedback. So encourage you to share this information with your instructors. The next slide, um, once again, back by popular demand, Panda is offering the Universal Design for Learning training. Um, that is an opportunity to learn about uh, this approach that really works to minimize barriers for students and maximize learning. Um, so this is a combination of learning through a recorded webinar, applying concepts to the classroom, and then sharing with colleagues on a follow-up webinar. And you know, Haley's put um, the link in the chat to find out more. And then finally, Atlas is going to be offering a couple of different study circles coming up this winter and spring. Um, one is going to be the Anti-Racist Praxis Study Circle. And you can see um, meeting dates for that one here, as well as the Trauma-Informed Practices Study Circle. So both of those opportunities are virtual. Um, applications should be available probably in December or early January. They will be posted on the Atlas website and publicized in the MNPD Connect once they are available. Then on the next slide, just as I mentioned earlier, we have been in the process. Our support network has been moving our online courses from um, Moodle platform and Schoology into fresh new, easy to navigate Canvas platform. So the ACES Foundations course launched this week and the ABE Foundations and CCRS Foundations courses launched earlier this fall. So I encourage you to check those out send your staff through them. Um, I think a really great opportunity to get some of that foundational knowledge about the standards and our adult education system. And then finally, just want to share the FY24 PD overview document that we developed and started distributing at Summer Institute this year. This was designed by our PD committee to be sort of a one page overview of some of the key events and cohorts being offered this year with links to some of our um, most important professional development planning resources. So I encourage you to check that out, print it and share it with your staff. So we are at time. I wanna remind folks on the next slide that you'll be able to find um, the recording of this webinar and the slides on the Literacy Action Network website. Thank you again to Wendy Herr from Literacy Action Network for hosting our webinar here today. And then we will see you again in early February for our next web chat on February 7th. I want to thank everybody for taking the time to join us today for your excellent questions and reflections. Um, we can stay on for a few minutes to answer any remaining questions, um, but thank you all, and we hope to see you again at another event soon.